What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode 41 of Into the Necrosphere. Joining me on today's show is going to be the owner and founder of One for Sorrow Tattoo, located right here in the United Kingdom, uh, the, a young man by the name of Mark Weatherhead. Uh, Mark and I were introduced by a mutual friend, uh, hit it off, and uh, ended up having a really fun and entertaining conversation uh, that ran for just over an hour, and we spoke about everything from black metal to tattoos to comic books to movies to all the other uh, interesting shit that you guys uh, tune in for uh, every single week. So that is going to be coming your way in just a second. But before I uh, I get to that, um, it is time for my demo of the week. And uh, this week's band hails from Estonia. The band is called Coffin. Uh, they put out a demo this year called Nailed Into the Coffin. Um, and uh, this is a track off of said demo. Uh, if you like... Bands like Gate Creeper um, or any other kind of overtly old school worshipping death metal bands, uh, this will be right up your street. This is a track called Legal Genocide. Look, I don't know what's going on, but I sure as hell know that it ain't no prison break. It ain't no kind of chemical that I ever heard about can make a dead man walk. This is something that nobody has ever heard about and nobody's ever seen before. This is hell on earth. This is pure hell on earth. was a legal genocide by coffin spelt with a k uh out of estonia the demo is called nailed into the coffin um and i uh, will post the link to their band camp in the description of the video and of the podcast so uh, if you like what you heard go and check them out uh tell them into the necrosphere sent you uh, and if you're in a band and you want me to hear your stuff uh, then drop me a line on email. Uh, the address is into the necrosphere at gmail.com. Uh, and you can also uh, slide up into my DMs on social media um, by following me uh, at iNecrosphere on Twitter. 
uh, or at Into the Necrosphere on Facebook and uh, Instagram. And if I like what I hear, I will feature it on the show. Um, whatever you do, though, do not send me a link saying, here's my demo. You can hear it for six pounds um, <clears throat> on Bandcamp um, because uh, that is for sure a way not to get yourself promoted on this or any other show. Um, anyway, uh, that aside, uh, there's a lot of good stuff coming up on today's episode. Like I said, I've got Mark Weatherhead coming up shortly. Um, I'm going to be talking about Old Smoke by Barishi, um, a record that's been out for a couple of me or a couple of months now, I think, um, and uh, that I've recently been spending a bit of time with. I don't know about uh, any of you guys, but I feel like uh, there's been a real lull in in good new releases coming out. I know there's been. I think the new Interferum came out, and there's a bunch of other stuff, but nothing has really kind of been grabbing me like the the uh, period that we had sort of between end of March and, and end of May where it, like, it was just every single week there was at least two or three great new records out. Um, but uh, Old Smoke is, uh, is, an, is an album that I uh, was recommended by Katie Irizarry, who I had on the show a couple of, uh, a couple of episodes ago. And uh, I've been spending a fair bit of time with it, thought you guys uh, would be interested in hearing it also. Um, and then I will also be doing my usual ranting and raving like a cranky old man at the news. So uh, that is coming your way after my interview with Mark. Um, I also wanted to let you guys know what's coming up in the next couple of weeks. So next week, uh, my guest is going to be Dan Thornton of Crimson Throne. Uh, Dan and I spoke about everything that the band has been getting up to uh, since the uh, Crimson Throne, uh, or since the Crimson Throne released their absolutely staggeringly brilliant uh, debut record of Void and Solitude. Uh, the week after, I've got uh, Rick Eaglestone. Um, he is joining me to talk about our favorite five records of uh, 2020 so far. So, kind of a halftime review, and then. Um, I have got one other very big name uh, guest that I've got lined up. I'm not going to say the name because, as you guys know, I'm a uh, paranoid uh, old coot. Um, but uh, I will, I'll put it to you this way. The the interview is scheduled for this week. So if it happens, then what I'll do is I'll, uh, I'll post on social media to confirm that it's happened and I'll let you know who it is then. But uh, it, it's, a, it's a big name. It's somebody who's been high up on my list of folks that I want to uh, interview for a while now. And uh, if, you've, uh, if you've listened to the show for, uh, for a period of time, you'll probably know what I'm talking about. Um, but uh, I'll leave it uh, on that cryptic note. Uh, in the meantime, let us welcome to Into the Necrosphere for the first time ever, Mr. Mark Weatherhead. But uh, yeah, Mark. So uh, so great to meet you. Great to have you on into the Necrosphere. And uh, we were this this was facilitated by a, uh, a mutual acquaintance of ours. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, for for anybody listening, the, uh, the the person who did this was actually uh, Lee from Unblessed Divine's brother Seth, um, a guy I've known literally since he was born. Really? I was friends with Lee when. Uh, when his mom was pregnant with Seth. So, but how did you, uh, how, how did you uh, make his acquaintance? We've just been communicating on uh, Facebook and on social media for a while now. He's been following my work. He's been very complimentary and helpful, um, especially during everything that's going down right now. Um, yeah, he's shown a lot of support and sort of really, uh, really been one of the, the, the good, the good guys for especially the dark art and the underground music scene as well. He's uh, always engaging with music ideas and things like that. It's uh, he's a really nice guy to sort of uh, bounce ideas off. Yeah. Yeah. So one, so I think there's a, there's a few things that you and I have in common, um, you know, music will be one of them that we can talk about in a little bit, but I, uh, I understand from uh, the message exchanges that we had, you got your first tattoo uh, from the Hebrew hammer as well. I did. As I did. Yeah. I, uh, I traveled all the way to the New York uh, last rides when it was the old shop in, um, uh, the, the the small one downtown one. Oh yeah uh yeah so i was lucky enough to get tattooed there and it was my first piece and um he double booked himself <laughs> so i traveled oh, shit. all the way um uh, luckily enough we managed to start it at the london show anyway but uh yeah it was really cool so it was great to get tattooed there and we've got it finished off at the shop as well so when, really when about uh, sorry to interrupt because mine mine got started at the london show as well but when when about did you get yours done um, it was the very, very first London show when it wasn't, it was before it went to tobacco docks. It was in okay. the, the tour building because there was last rights and there was also Philip Lou 
uh, mm-hmm. on the booth opposite, and they kind of had this sort of like whole big thing going on between the two of them. It was really cool. So uh, yeah, that was my first first ever tattoo. Uh, when he starts the machine up, and then the lights start going, and you know you're in for trouble. Yeah, were you? Uh, and 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 again, just for just for context, um, we are talking about uh, Leorsifer, who has been on the show a couple of times, and uh, you know, guy who I don't know how, how much you've stayed in touch with him. I, I he and I just when we when when he tattooed me, we just really really hit it off, and mm. you know, we, we've kind of become really really good friends since. But um, question for you, as far as your experience for getting tattooed by him, were you shitting yourself beforehand, or uh, what, what, first, what were you expecting? The first time, because it was at the London show, my first tattoo at a convention as well, so I was kind of a bit yeah. apprehensive over that whole thing. Um, he wasn't feeling really very well either. He had like really bad allergies or something like that, and jet lag and everything. So um, yeah, it was it was a real like nerve wracking situation. But then when we went to get the piece finished at Last Rides, it was totally different. It was a really nice experience. You know, we went there, we hung out, and. Um, I've actually been meeting up with Leo at conventions and things like that for, well, the past few years since I started tattooing as well. So, yeah, we've managed to keep in touch and we message each other like regularly, see how things are going. And uh, he wants to come to the studio and guest spot with us. So I'm really looking forward to that with uh, Benjamin Moss and Sarah and Trini as well. So it'd be really cool to get them all over. All, all, all the way to the uh, the mean streets of, uh, of Shrewsbury. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, okay. yeah. So okay, so 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 you have to give some context here because again, I know Shrewsbury quite well because my okay. my daughter lives in Bucknell. Okay. So uh, I go to well, at least for a period of time, I used to go to Shropshire um, every other weekend. I, I've I've spent an extraordinary amount of time there. My uh, my failed marriage to her mother was actually <laughs> in Shrewsbury as well. Really? Uh, yeah. My I should say sorry. My 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 wedding. Um, but uh, anyway, the uh, you know and and. You know, by the way, I just I simply don't go there anymore because my daughter comes here now. So it's not mm-hmm. like uh, there was a big falling out or anything. But it it's a very different part of the world and certainly a different part of the country. How would you describe Shrewsbury to anybody that has that has not been there and whose probably reference point when it comes to the UK is London or Manchester or kind of one of the bigger cities? It looks like um, some of that Shrewsbury uh, internet has uh, got you stopped there. You you were you were kind of yeah, stalling there for a second. It's slowing down a little. Let me just. Uh... Okay. How's yeah, that? no, it, it it seems fine now. I thought it might be okay. the the Shrewsbury elite had uh, <laughs> had heard the name mentioned. Like, quick, start monitoring his internet feed. <laughs> yeah. Um, so where Shrewsbury is, it's uh, it is Middle England. It's kind of um, we're right on the border with Wales. So yeah. we used to be the border town, and we actually have a bridge from uh, from Wales going into England. We used to sort of I kind of stop them from getting in, I guess. Um, and it is a very old, like medieval town, castle, that sort of thing. We've got a lot of history around here, um, and I say for the most part, it's quite a conservative little place as well as you probably mm-hmm. know it's quite old-fashioned in its ways um so to come here and open up a dark art studio which uh yeah it was quite controversial to say the least uh, our planning permission we had to put into the council and we got 17 uh obligations before we opened up the studio one of which called me a practitioner of the dark arts which i'm really proud of <laughs> super proud of that one <laughs> Um, but equally now the, the studio looks great and the people who live around here are pretty happy with us and they actually think it looks a lot nicer than what they were expecting so it's it's mm. quite quite cool to be around here as well yeah 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 no I I, I remember so as, you know I, I remember going to uh, pick my daughter up from school um, you know and I had uh, one one of the days and and bear in mind you know again for people that don't know Bucknell is is significantly smaller than Shrewsbury so it's not you know Shrewsbury it's not necessarily a, a reflection on on Shrewsbury this is more just a, a view of of uh, Shropshire in general but I had my um my Transylvanian hunger t-shirt on mm. and the number of looks that I got 
from that. I mean, fortunately, they don't have police in the village because if they did, there would have been, um, yeah, there, 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 there may have been uh, some fallout from that. But how did they? How did they come on calling you a uh, a practitioner of the dark arts? I don't know. I think they must have done like a Google search and checked out social media and stuff like that because it was this really old couple that lived next door and they're kind of like used to be retired, uh, I think they're retired lawyers or something like that. And um, even my friend who owns the building says that they were just an absolute pain in the ass when he had the building and he was renovating this place as well. So uh, I think they're just kind of bored. And um, when they heard that there was a tattoo studio, they automatically thought that it was going to be a drug den and all this kind of stuff. So, yeah, yeah. Turned, um, out, turned out just to be a house of horrors. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, at one, if, if they'd only known some of the things we've had in this place. We had, um, do you know Curiosities from the Fifth Corner? No. Uh, it uh, uh, is what it is. Is a guy who, cre- who collects and deals in the weirdest of the weird. So um, we used to have like a museum in here. We've still got a lot of stuff as well. Um, skulls, mummified things, taxidermy, you name it, we've had it. Um, and at one point, we had a full mummified woman. Holy shit. So, uh, yeah, he, he, we had her in the studio for, I think, a good six, 12 months, something like that. She was here for a while. Her name was Alice. Um, she even had her eyelashes and hairy legs and apparently even a hairy <laughs> vagina, but I didn't go that close to inspect. Yeah. So, yeah, we've had some like absolutely crazy shit. None of these people around here were anywhere near aware of what was in the studio. We've still got things like, you know, we've got mummified feet and skulls and hands and taxidermy and all these sort of crazy weird things going on. But it's more sort of like about uh, that balance between a a tattoo studio, but more about art and um, inspiration and creating an atmosphere. Again, like when I go back to when we got tattooed by Leo at Last Rites, when you walk in there, there was a feel. Yeah, you know, you know you're in for something unique and something special. It's not just about getting a tattoo. It's about the event, the day, the getting there, the you know, the engaging with the, the tattoo artist as well, and working on a, a dark art piece together. You know, this this collaboration. So I think that's what, something we wanted to recreate with the studio as well. Was, yeah, um, and I think we're pretty pretty good at it. Well, the thing is, one thing that that nobody will ever be able to say about Lior is that he is not absolutely the the real deal. Um, I mean, you know, the fact that absolutely. he, you know, he was very candid in, on the interview that he was on uh, on the show about his views on uh, Last Rites and you know why he ended up uh, moving on. And a lot of times when uh, when people look at my tattoos, I only have two. I've got one that Dan Marshall gave me, and uh, who's also a, a, a Last Rites mm-hmm. alumni. Um, and then one that Lior gave me. Lior is my first, and I, I I love my Dan Marshall tattoo, but there's there's something extremely special to me about the Lior tattoo, and part of it is um, like the best way that I can describe it, and I I, I kind of tried to do it on the episode when I was was speaking to Lior, but I I felt like in the time that the, that we got to know each other, there was he he has a very emotive way of of drawing and a very emotive way of tattooing, and I think that. Um, my girlfriend has pointed this out too, and and, and other people that, that know me, and they they whenever they look at the piece that he did for me, they they always say that's the one that kind of seems to capture your personality the best. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was, I mean, I gave him zero guidance. I literally just said I, I I pointed to a few things that he had done. Same with same as with with Dan, I pointed to a few things that he had done. Um, you know, and I just said I like this, I like this, I like this. I think the only guidance I gave him was, you know, he asked me, "Do you want the eyes blacked out or do you want the eyes um, fold in?" And I said, "No, blacked out looks more mm-hmm. looks more mean." Yeah. But that was it. Everything else, he he, you know, was was was, was all him. And you know, the, the end result, as I said, has a there's like a there's like a much deeper connection there than just some bullshit that people, somebody you know went to Thailand and got tattooed. You know. I, I'm not disparaging people that get stuff like that done, but I just, it's, it's just, it's not the way I would go with a, with a tattoo. No. No. Um, but uh, yeah, like I said, completely real deal guy. Question for you, just circling back to your own experience with him. Had you already decided that you, you were going to get into tattooing when that happened or were, were you still no. a, a young no, whippersnapper? I was still pretty young. Um, I, I got, tattoo by Leo and I was kind of like I just finished sort of like uh, doing my painting and fine art degree and all that sort of stuff and I was kind of in that sort of limbo sort of phase before I went kind of traveling out towards Asia and, um, and that sort of thing 
Uh, and I definitely knew I sort of like the style I kind of wanted. And um, they put me on to sort of Lior and Last Wright's work in particular. And I was just, I, I got in contact with Lior and we were just like, I coming over, we're going to get tattooed by you. The, we talked about a couple of ideas and it was, um, the piece itself was inspired um, by the artwork from Mick Kenny, the guitarist and founder of uh, Anon Mathrak. Mm -hmm. um, so it was based on a piece like that, which we um, would bounce around a few ideas and then he freehanded the whole piece. So there was no stencil, there was nothing about that. And I always remember he, we were we were at the show and he's he's drawing away and then he's tattooing and I'm watching him tattoo and he's pulling these crazy weird faces and stuff. Yeah. Yearning and he's doing all this stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know that. And then you, you look at him, you kind of realize what he's doing. He's kind of understanding the muscle structure of the face and where yeah. things are going to tighten up and where things are going to crease up and things like that as he's working. So he's kind of like pulling his face in all these crazy weird ways and pulling these evil faces. And it makes sense. It's kind of like that's how deep he gets into a piece. He kind of yeah, yeah. emulate that piece in his own physical being as well. It's kind of crazy to kind of watch. It's cool. He sings an awful lot while he's, uh, while he's tattooing as well. <laughs> and he's, like, yeah, and he has, a, he has a really goofy laugh as well. Which yeah, really yeah. Like. Now, the, the funniest memory I have of him at the show was uh, there was a buddy of mine that was sitting with me while I was getting tattooed. And um, at one point, Leo sneezed and my friend was like, bless you. He looks up and he <laughs> goes, that, yeah. why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's him, yeah. Yeah. So, so what, what made you decide that, um, you know, that tattooing was your, your forte? Because I guess, I mean, I, I, I obviously, my own educational background is probably the exact opposite to, uh, to art, but I guess you kind of, by, by what you were saying is you were sort of at this crossroads about, you you know you've got a fine art degree. What do you do next? So what what exactly? I guess I guess how did the how did you decide that that tattooing would be your your medium or at least one of your mediums? I think it was sort of from that point of getting tattooed by Leo and realizing that this is not just sort of like the 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 medium that people are very quick to judge. You know, it, it's it's not just the flash on the wall. It's not just that sort of. You can actually create legitimate pieces of artwork with it. And even when I was sort of doing my degree and even back before then, when I was a kid, I was always drawing things like, you know, skulls and weird faces and things like that. And that was always like a big influence, in like comic book artwork as well. So it was a very much of a natural medium for me to start going into for from that point. So as soon as I got tattooed, I was kind of like, I want to have me some of that. That's pretty cool. Mm. Then it was the difficult part of getting into it. So you can you can go a couple of different ways. You can do the the wrong way, which is probably picking up a machine off eBay and just start massacring your friends. Or you can or you can you, end up in prison and start and you learn your trade up, there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Or you can yeah. You can, really, you can really fuck somebody up, or you can you know look about doing things the right way, and you can get an apprenticeship and you know learn from the bottom up, which is the way I wanted to do it. Which is the longer way. It's the much harder way, and it takes way more time, but it's the right way. It's the best way of doing it. So that's where what I was in Shrewsbury, as you probably know, it's a small town. There's a lot of studios. It's difficult to get into some of these studios because they've got no space and not getting into an apprenticeship is difficult enough as it is. That's when I went over to Germany and got some tattoos by Tommy Leventler, mm -hmm. who again is another last rights, um, alumni. Yeah. I, I remember him. I, I remember when I was, so I, I got, I got, kind of stuck onto the idea of getting a tattoo by uh by Lior because a friend of mine had been tattooed by Paul and then I uh, I would always go onto the Last Rights website and obviously they always had the the apprentices and you know whoever was working mm -hmm. there they'd mm -hmm. have their stuff up and um yeah I just I, I just saw Lior stuff and there was just something about it that, 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 that just spoke to me and same with Dan Mm. But I remember all of the, uh, you know, all of the other people that he had on there. And, and even over the years, he's had fucking incredible artists go through that place. Yeah. You know, he's been the the a, a guide to, you know, an awful lot of just absolutely fucking first class artists. I mean, mm. that, that's for sure. When I started learning from Tommy, it was a, a very full on sort of this is you start from the bottom up sort of thing. Um, from one point when I was traveling, say, five hours a day just to open up a studio, make sure the place was clean and, you know, not even having an appointment, just making sure that, that studio was open and looked after. Um, and then when it got to the point where I actually left and I started working with Gil um, at Reincarnation, 
uh, Tommy was really cool. He was actually very cool. We ended things on a very good, nice, even even way. And even to this day, he still comes to the studio and he guest spots as well. What eventually kind of drew you back to to Shrewsbury? Because, you know, particularly for the kind of the style that you do and, and you know, the... I guess the, the the vibe of your of your shop. I, I'm I'm not going to lie. I've not seen any. The times I've been in Shrewsbury, I've not seen an awful lot of people walking around. You know, look like either you or I. <laughs> I, I have no, I've gotten no, a lot of very it's not, it's not, very uh, kind of off kilter looks from people because of the t-shirts I've had on or, or whatever the case may be. But yeah, yeah. I think we're probably like maybe me and my friends were probably the only few people that were like that around here. Yeah. Uh, so we were definitely sort of ostracized. I was definitely stood out a little bit for that. Um, but yeah, the reason for moving back from Shrewsbury was um, back in 2016, my father died uh, and I was out in Germany and it was kind of like there was, um, I don't know, it just didn't feel right kind of being there for a while, you know, and I just, there was something not kind of comfortable. Um, as much as I love working with Gil and go back and I still get spot with him. Um, it was kind of that point where it's like, you know, I need to kind of have my home again. I need my kind of close friends around me a little bit more and that sort of thing. So then there was an opportunity, the space itself kind of arose and um, the guy who owns it was originally going to be moving to Thailand and he, the, the sale of his business kind of fell through. So he's kind of got some offices in the same building now, but this space came available and it was just too good to kind of turn down. It was kind of mm. like, look, if, if I always saw the space and thought that would make one hell of a studio and it has, you know, it was kind of like, if I don't snatch it up there, then it could be years or you would never ever find a space like this again. You know, we've got these, um, these markings and stuff on some of the uh, the beams downstairs and they had somebody come in and check them they're kind of like witchcraft marks to protect against evil spirits and stuff like these burnings going down all these all these wooden beams and stuff so there's a lot of history in the place like, I was, so i was history. literally going to ask you that now because i watched the and i have to say by the way fucking outstanding documentary that you guys did on the on the shop Thank and kind you. of the velocity behind the shop, but I know um, I can't remember whether it was you that mentioned it that there was you know uh, some some history to um, to the building that you guys are in right now. Have you done any digging into into the the, the specifics of that? Um, Simon, who owns a place, he's actually done like a little bit of digging and stuff around. Um, a, a lot of it is the, uh, to do with some of the buildings that are around here were quite uh, well to do. So this was part of the storage. And I think sort of uh, usually somebody who works in a place like this would also live here as well. So yeah. um, it's kind of, it, it kind of has both work and um, uh, like, uh, like residential uh, history to it. Um, but within Shrewsbury, we have, loads of like crazy weird things you know i think just as well which is kind of creepy and weird there are there's like loads of little tunnels and stuff that go underneath the city itself we have um, a guy who does a lot of urban exploring and stuff and he came around checking out the building and he wants to do loads of photographs and that sort of stuff within this place and he was telling us yeah they're like tunnels that you know there's roadworks that they will do and at night he would just wait for the guys to leave and he'll just be down and into these like little tunnels and he'll just go kind of walking around the, around the town walls and things like that and just exploring that's what's there and it's absolutely crazy how far these things can go so we've got a hell of a lot of history there you know that's a, yeah, i yeah. mean being a medieval town it goes right back to sort of like the black death and things like that as well yeah can you do any tours and stuff through those tunnels or is it just like is it sort of incidental un, untouched by modern man kind of, <laughs> kind of, shit? of it, is, it is kind of untouched and you yeah. have to sort of like you know grab the opportunity when they arise when they're kind of left open or something like that um and you have to like know how to get into these things you know so mm. it's um it's it, it's it's not something you can do every day it's something like if if something's open you have to kind of jump in get get in there before they close it up and it's uh, it's gone again for however many years. Yeah. But um, there are tours around town. There are tours like, you know, ghost tours and kind of history tours and stuff like that. So that sort of thing you can kind of do. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and again, I, I will, I will stress to people like when you, like when, whenever you go or like there's kind of this off ramp that you take off the motorway and then it's probably about 10 miles or so. And then you're in, in uh Shropshire and you, you know, the, the drive is absolutely beautiful. I, I think I mentioned, um, uh, you know, one of the, one of the records I really discovered on that drive was Exuvia by, by Runes of Everest because it's, it, it was it, literally the, 
the duration of the album was as long as it took me to uh, to get to my daughter's uh, to, or to, to to her mom's house. But uh, mm. anyway, the the like you know if you if you drive around there at night, I mean, there's fucking nothing going on there. There's no light. There's no nothing. And and what happened to me once is I was I was driving while it was raining, and for some reason both of my front beams just clipped off. Oh. And I had to do about a half an hour's drive with my fucking um, uh, what's name with my uh, with my uh, brights on, um, or my full beam on, and uh, yeah, dude, that was fucking nerve wracking. If you like, mm-hmm. likewise, I've gotten lost before there. You know, prior to um, them extending the, uh, the, the, mo- the 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 cell signal to be able to pick up <laughs> my sat nav, and I think at one point I was I I, I came to this this uh, random golf course in the middle of nowhere at about three thirty in the morning. I was mm-hmm. fucking livid, but yeah, it, it really is quite a it, and it's it's a stunningly beautiful area, but but very remote and kind of in some ways in like in a, in nice ways as well. It's kind of untouched, um, mm-hmm. which, which I kind of love about, about it as well. I mean, I genuinely re- really enjoy visiting there. Um, yeah, but there's definitely like a, there's an untouched quality to it. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it, it hasn't changed or developed a, too fast. I think you know some places they can sort of like suddenly have this big boom, and this has taken its time and it is expanding slowly, but it's doing it at its own pace. It's doing it in its own own uh, own way. And from going from living to say in like Cologne, which has got like one million people, it's quite a busy city. And then to come to Shrewsbury, you def- definitely feel like a slowing down of everything, you know. Yeah. The pace of life is a little bit easier. And I think that's one thing which I kind of was quite stressful was living in this sort of busy, busy city where there's just so many people. And now it's quite cool. I can just go from home to work, chill out, see some friends and that sort of thing. You know, it's yeah, not, yeah. Uh, the pace of life has come down a lot, which is good. So I- I'm going to assume that you grew up in that area? Yeah, yeah it's my hometown. Um, so, yeah. And what how, how, what what do they make of you when you were in school? Because I would assume that you know this, uh, you know the the interest in in uh, you know the the darker side of life, you know, probably stems <laughs> back to a relatively early age for you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when I was at school, I, we were definitely sort of like the kids listening to sort of like Slayer and Sepultura and things like that, those kind of bands. Yeah, as we probably all were at that sort of time. Yeah. Um, and then I think it was probably when I sort of left school and we were doing like the sixth form thing, and that's where I kind of made like a real hardcore group of friends, um, and that's where the black metal and that sort of thing kind of came into it. Um, there were two groups. I always remember there was like two groups. Of, so there was the guys who were into like the black metal, and then the guys who were into like the hardcore stuff. Mm. And the only band that we could pretty much agree on was like Typo Negative or something like that. That was the, that was the band <laughs> that kind of straddled both. Everybody yeah. was kind of, okay, we can both like those. And Pantera, that was probably another one as well. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, ty- t- t- Typo are one of those rare like crossover groups. No matter what mm. genre of metal you're into, there's there's very, very few people that you'll say, hey, man, you listen to Typo Negative and they'll go, no, it's a bunch of shit. But mm. I, I don't know whether Seth ever explained anything to you about the city that we grew up in. But if you wanted to come across, I mean, literally, it's like uh, I described it once as, as Utah, where, uh, you know, if if the people in Utah weren't such fucking sinners. So <laughs> it's like the the most just like, I mean, and not, not everybody, you know, for, for the most part, like if you ever if you ever showed up there. Um, you know, as a as a traveler, and you you went to a couple of restaurants and stuff like that. You you know, everybody would would welcome you with open arms. That they look at you a bit funny because of the tattoos, but mm-hmm. you, you would be amazed by the level of hospitality and stuff like that. But the, the the attitude of people in school, like I was literally branded a Satanist for no for no good reason from the the the, the moment that I set foot in school. The first the first uh, justification for it was. Because I listened to uh, like one one of my bands when I was uh, seven years old was Aha, so evil. Then I, w- w- as as I grew a little bit older, I you know got a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles came out. I was a big fan of that. Mm-hmm. Word went round the the school Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is evil. Jackie has got a whole bunch of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle shit all over his suitcase, and you know he draws it all the time. So Satanist. Mm-hmm. Then I discovered ACDC. Also, obviously, after Christ, devil comes. That was the right. the myth around that. And, yeah, yeah. you know, they used to say that the singer drinks cat blood before he goes on stage <laughs> and all the shit. So, obviously, 
you know, devilish. Then Metallica, also evil. Guns mm. N' Roses, evil. <laughs> and it kind of progressed on to like, like that until by the time that I'd sort of listened to Deer Side and Obituary, nobody could say anything because none of the bands I was listening to were in any of the books that they read. So they were, yeah, so, just- so they were like, oh, do you listen to heavy metal as well? I'm like, yeah, I do, but you know, it's none of the stuff that's in those books, none of it, because that stuff is bad. Mm, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's but then in the meantime, you know, you're you're hard. listening to like Dead by Dawn or what you know, whatever. <laughs> but um was that was was there was there any of that crazy backward shit in, in uh in Shrewsbury as well? I think there, there, there was definitely some sort of like uh, strange looks and things like that. Uh yeah. again, we were sort of like very much a group of friends uh, like myself, Nick, his brother, Kev, and those sort of things. And we were kind of like our own kind of little community. So we didn't necessarily engage too much with those sort of people. We were all kind of like not necessarily out and about in the, the rest of the town. And we did have like our own local pub or something that we would go to, which would play all that kind of music. It would be full of like, you know, the local bikers. It would be full of sort of all sorts of crazy people and junkies and all that sort of stuff. And it was, everybody was accepting that. So that kind of place was quite homely. Yeah. For the people who then came into that sort of place and they weren't really used to it and used to try and maybe make a bit of noise, it was probably not the right pub to be doing that sort of thing. And yeah, yeah, so you yeah. kind of learn from an early age how to behave and that sort of thing. And um, you, luckily we, we, we were okay there. We didn't have any sort of strange looks and stuff. But I think, you know, as you're a kid, so you're wearing black and walking down the street, you are going to get sort of shouted at and that sort of thing. But uh I think, yeah. I don't know, maybe if he wasn't wearing black, maybe it was something else. They would find something to shout at you. They would find yeah, something yeah. To, to, to give you, give you oh, over, over a year, it was like the, the first time, well, I, I've, I've been called a grunger <laughs> and I've been called a goth. It's like, fuck, man, I couldn't be anything, anything further from either of those two. Yeah, yeah, I think it's just like the buzzword, isn't it? You know, Grebos, that was the one. Grebos. Grebos. That was a word, yeah. I used to get that quite a lot. Yeah. Shit. Um, what kind of started you down that, that journey of, uh, of discovery? Because I think, you know, my, my, my theory around metal in, in particular, and I, and I've really kind of come to, um, I think have that reinforced, have that view reinforced since I moved to the UK, which was, which is now, you know, about 18 years ago, actually Mm -hmm. more than 18 years ago is there are, there are some people for whom the, the the journey is very much organic and they kind of discover everything by themselves. And, and generally speaking, I think those are the people that tend to stick with it for the rest of their life. Um, and then I think also because generally metal folk are, are a fairly accepting bunch, uh, I think there's a lot of people that are kind of, you know, that have trouble figuring out where they fit into society and, and you know, have trouble fitting in at school and things like that. And they end up sort of, you know, falling into the metal scene for a period of time. And you know, probably uh, dress like Slipknot fans, and then about four years later, they'll they'll be out of it. And then when you ask them, you know, you know, what are you, uh, you know, are you still into it? No, no, I I outgrew it. Mm. So uh, I'm curious, kind of, what was your and, and and I mean, ultimately, I can summarize the theory with that the the saying about art, you know, great art chooses you. Um, yeah. But but I I'm curious as 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 to how your kind of journey began. I I have a suspicion we probably may share some some similar similarities on that front. I think it started off by you know when you have like friends who are usually invariably older than you, and they're yeah. kind of like hey check this out. So yeah, I think it was probably uh, Slayer. I think was probably one of my first first uh, metal bands that I listened to actually Slayer. And then after that, I kind of. I uh, remember people introducing us to things like Megadeth and, you know, Metallica as well, a little bit more. Machine Head, I think, Burn My Eyes had not long come out, I think, around that time. Uh, so those were the sort of like albums that really kind of started gripping me. And then I was like, I've got to find more of this stuff. This is like fantastic, you know. And then you start exploring and then you try and find something that's maybe a little bit darker, a little bit heavier. And you get recommended this, that and the other. But I think with the the black metal and like maybe doom and things like that, that probably started a little bit later when I was probably sort of like sort of 16, 17, I think around that sort of time. That's when I kind of found that or I was shown a little bit more stuff. And I think actually one of the first albums was probably um, Dusk and Her Embrace, which actually was one of the first sort of black metal albums I kind of stumbled across. And I was like, okay, this is really cool. And then Dimmer Bogear and things like that. And then you kind yeah. of, you know, start going oh there's mayhem and then you research the history and stuff when you realize that this whole scene has like 
just craziness going throughout. Yeah. And there's a very special time. I don't know whether it's just associated with, you know, the fact that you're at that age and nostalgia and things like that. But I think there was definitely sort of a special time where you couldn't get these things just by going to a record store. You couldn't find that. You had to sort of like mail order. Sometimes you had to put your money inside a blank CD case, <laughs> send it off to somewhere in like the middle yeah. of fucking Eastern Europe somewhere. Yeah. And yeah. hope that it came back with a CD and then yeah. you know, you would, they, they would post it back to you. And you just have to sub- subscribe to it. I think it was Supernal Records. That was one. Yeah, I, rem- I remember Supernal Records. I bought a yeah, yeah. shit load of stuff from them when, uh, when I first moved here. I used to love when you used to get like the little catalog come through the post yeah, and you yeah, have like yeah. little write ups and there was sort of like I thought, uh, learned about Hate Forest. Yeah. Rutka. Rutka, yeah. yeah. Dude, I had a fucking notebook where I would literally plan what I was going to buy in that in that month because, you know, I was, I was only earning about 200, 220 pounds a week or so. So mm-hmm. literally like right there, like planning out, okay, this is the roadmap. <laughs> I'm getting yeah, these yeah. CDs next month. These are the following month. I mean, fucking, mm. and now I, I, you know, my entire CD collection is, is shoved into a whole bunch of um, those uh, CD envelope booklets, and I've I've thrown everything else out. But I remember how, like, how important a CD was to me. Like, if if it came through the door, it was literally like it was all I was going to do for the rest of the week is just listen to that one CD, study the artwork, study the lyrics. Mm. It's it's weird as well how how you know I've spoken about this before, but how streaming, uh, as an example, has taken away the value of. Um, of music and of art, at least, sorry, art in the medium of music to the extent that it has. It's, um, yeah, I think it's because you don't have something tangible. Yeah. You know, this is, um, I've actually gone back and I, I do buy select vinyls and things like that now as well, just because I like that artwork. I like that feel of being able to open it, open the book, listen to the album and sort of have something there to kind of you know, represent what you've just bought, where you kind of just hit click and go to PayPal. I don't think you value it as much. No, no, definitely yeah. not. And and I, I I I was about to say I think I think the money thing is is a big part of it. I think the fact that people have to part ways with or used to have to part ways with money to get something, it means mm. that there's like that level of investment in it beforehand, um, yeah. which you know which nowadays you don't have. You know you know some people will. I mean I pay for Cobas. Um, because I'm a fucking sound quality geek, but you know, a lot of people mm. just stick to the free version of, of Spotify and they put up with the bullshit ads and, and that's about it. And, and yeah, that, um, increasingly the, the youth, um, <laughs> only listen to like two, three songs off an album. They don't even listen to the full thing. You know, for me, that was, the, don't always listen to it in the right order. The order exactly. The that was fucking, and that was, that was the, the most, you know, unforgivable crime you could possibly commit when I was young. You know, you listen to the, to, to the album end to end. If you skipped anything out there, you, you were a, a fake and a poser. So, yeah. you know, excommunicated the one, from the group. The other thing I remember was doing as well with the kid was when you, when you wanted to buy a CD and it was in store, you would have to go the first day it was out because you knew that there would be only so many copies of the Digipack there, which you always had yes. next to maybe one or yeah, two yeah. tracks on. And you're like, I want to fucking get that and none of my friends can have it. And that yeah. was it. So you got to be the first one there to get it and listen to those extra tracks. And and then I think it was it was actually Slayer, and they pissed me so oh, oh they pissed me off so much with this. So you buy the album when it first comes out, you think that's great, and then six months later they re-release the album with yeah. the packs. Like, that is not the way it's done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they 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 were notorious for. I mean, they're not as bad as Iron Maiden, but you know I didn't oh. like Iron Maiden, so it didn't didn't bother me. But Slayer were very bad for that. They would always have like special edition blah, blah, ultimate edition of a record come out and always have like those two, three extra songs. And then if you did hear it at somebody else's house because you were t- so sick of hearing the other songs, mm-hmm. those would always be the ones that sound the best. Like, fuck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I remember paying people you know, quite a significant amount of money just to fucking copy some of those bonus tracks oh, because yeah. I was so desperate to get them. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But what was your first, what was your first ever Slayer song that you heard? I think it was actually something off Diablos and Musica, actually. Yeah. I think it was actually that that album. I remember my friend Brett gave it to me. He was like a bass player at the time, and he used to come and stay with his grandparents who lived close by where I was. And he he introduced me to like, he'd check this out, and it had just come out. And I was like, wow, this is fucking cool, man. And it was just like the artwork as well. I think that actually has always stuck with me. The artwork from that as well is kind of like, you know, with the creepy priest that they had on it and stuff. That, And I think that's kind of, were you know part of a big influence in my in my stuff as well so there was that and there was 
Machine Head Burn My Eyes as well was another good one. I think that was another big milestone in my choice of music. I think there was always that kind of feel, that really dark kind of feel to the, to the music, whereas where something like, um, I don't know, Metallica didn't quite hit it for me. Mm. They didn't quite have that level of darkness, which I was after. And then obviously from there, you kind of start progressing into things like black metal, maybe some death metal and things like that. So you, it, it has to have that kind of, feel to it i think yeah 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 no i remember uh, i remember very very clearly the day that a guy handed me a copy of um decade of aggression and i remember hearing the that opening uh sample that they play just before hello wait starts and then uh you know you, you're walking, mm. walking, and then, like it, the song starts playing and i remember being fucking terrified because at the time mm. you know, i grew up in quite a religious home so uh, you know at the time i was i was still relatively devout and i you know i used to say my prayers and go to church and stuff and i was just terrified and trying to you know, like end up at a point where you're negotiating with the lord like all right you know can't be this bad because you gave them the talent so you know i shouldn't be able to listen to this <laughs> and then you know they do hello wait and then you get to the next song i am the antichrist it's like, okay mm. i just won't sing that part of the song but i still <laughs> When I was uh, I was twelve years old when I got that, but I remember being so fucking blown away. Like just ev- what, like every single song was just an absolute masterpiece. But I spoke to somebody about this on a, a couple of episodes ago as well. But the the whole bit about you know what we were saying about uh, people not really parting ways with money and stuff like that anymore, and so therefore it doesn't mean as much to them. Mm. You see that in the way people respond to shows as well. Because I've, I've spoken about this before, but the 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 way people used to respond, you know, the way people responded at the first Slayer show that I went to versus their last ever show was fucking night and day. I mean, mm-hmm. I remember this. Seth made a comment on a on a video that I posted of of uh, Slayer doing Rain in Blood, um, and uh, I mean there was like a couple of people, you know, doing a few windmills and some head banging, but nothing nothing crazy. Then the first time that I saw them, I mean, it was a, it was fucking mayhem. The, yeah. the you know, if you watch any of the older videos, like if you watch anything from the eighties, um, I mean, it looks like people are going to die. Mm. It, it literally looks like you know, you 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 went into those pits with your you know, you, you, you signed an indemnity waiver right at right right at the entrance, and like, okay, I, I might not be yeah. coming back. I remember seeing Slayer at uh, uh, Nottingham Rock City, and they were supporting I Maiden, I think, the day after, and. Um, we went there and there was three of us drove over and we took a friend of mine and he'd, he'd broken his foot, but he was still not going to miss this fucking Slayer gig. So his foot's in, pla- in a cast and everything. And we stood sort of, it goes down onto the dance floor and there's some steps. So we stood kind of close to the step sort of thing because it was kind of the safest sort of area for him. Slayer come on, that whole downstairs is just a, just a pit. It just erupts. And the look on his face was just a picture. He was just like, what the fuck is this? He turns around and he's watching the band and we just couldn't resist it. We were just like, in you go, you know, you know <laughs> cast or no cast, off you go. You yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then you look no. back and on the balconies, the balconies above, there's pits going on in the balcony, you know? Yeah, dude. No, I mean, you know, oh. in, in, in the old days, if you, if you didn't want to be part of the pit, you were just made part of the pit. You know, you didn't have yeah, a choice. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, you know, I remember even with bands like um, Danzig, I remember seeing Tomahawk, uh, which was one of um, Mike Patton's bands. And that's not really, even really like a, a mosh heavy band, but people went fucking ballistic when they played. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I remember Melvin's opened for them as well. The, the crowd was going fucking nuts. Yeah. But uh, you, yeah, you just don't um, you just don't really see that anymore. Um, I don't know whether people have become apathetic, whether it's you know whether we're right in, in our theory about you know people spending money, but yeah, the vibe at vibe at shows is definitely is definitely changed quite quite substantially but i wanted to ask you you know in in terms of uh the the comic book art that you mentioned before um who are some of your who are some of your favorite artists or, or some of your influences in the uh in the, in the comic book scene i think uh, my biggest influence artistically was probably dave mckean yeah um, probably not so like the most well known uh, for doing like a lot of comics but i think i ca- i was given a copy of arkham asylum uh, with him and grant morrison and that just blew me away because before at the end you thought oh it's going to be all superman and spider-man and things like that and then i got given this and i was like what the fuck is this it was just a twisted ride from the beginning mm. straight away through you know from the where she's like the mom is in the bed and she's got like the bugs coming out of her mouth and stuff like that and there's the the phone call and the the, the pencil is getting sharpened like what the hell is that noise 
it was just a it, it just showed that again comic book art didn't have to be very clean no it didn't no, have no. to be this sort of everything has to stick within its its little framework you know it can be just crazy and i think it it, it shows the story it shows that arkham asylum is that sort of that kind of place it's just nuts yeah do you still um, read so comic books uh, now and then I do. I kind of go back and I read sort of like a few other sort of like older things as well. I restarted uh, Hellblazer as mm -hmm. well. That was another, one of my favorite ones. Preacher as well, those kind of books. Tends to be less of the superhero stuff, more, you know, these kind of maybe like anti-heroes or whatever you want to call them. I, 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 I ask because I'm, I'm massively still into it myself, but same, mm. same as you. I, I, I grew up on kind of that very clean uh, comic art style. And then I, you know, in time started discovering, you know, much, much darker stuff. So Spawn, I, I, you know, I, I really, really loved the Hellspawn reboot. Mm. You know, so you talk about dark shit. I don't know whether you ever read that, but firstly, the, the art, and I asked you this particularly because I wanted to know whether you knew who uh, Angel Medina is because Angel Medina did the art for Hellspawn. Okay. And it is, is absolutely astounding. But there's one uh there's one part in the in the in the very first issue um where Clown is sitting talking to this guy and you see the guy with this look on his face, like just this really like moronic look on his face, and you 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 know the you start start to kind of get the idea that he's he's busy watching a film. And Clown is busy whispering all these things in his ear in the in the theater, you know, about the girl on the on the film and you know, he says, you know, we both know that bio that um, you know human biology dictates that she can't be doing those things without it hurting her, and blah blah blah. And you kind of see the guy's face, you know, still looking really goofy, like he's, uh, you know, you start getting the impression he may be, uh, maybe uh, servicing himself. Mm. And then, and then, Angel Medina done it so fucking well that there's 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 two pages on 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 this page is like you know, multiple frames of him. Uh, what's him? Uh, telling the guy all about the girl and all about her background and how she was abused and blah, blah, blah. Then in the next frame, it's just one kind of splash graphic and Clown says, it must be great to see how well your daughter has done for herself. And then you page mm -hmm. over and then the guy's still got the same look on his face, but he's sitting in an, he's, he's in an alleyway and both his uh, wrists are slit. And I just thought that was some of the darkest, fucking grimmest, gnarliest shit that I'd ever seen. But it was the the uh, Angel Medina had brought that to life so well with his artwork, and I and I implore anybody. I don't give a fuck if you don't read comics anymore, but but if you're going to read anything to see how how to what level that medium can go, mm. that Hellspawn reboot is astounding. I mean, it's they comics are definitely sort of like this this un, I say untapped resource. I think things like that are untapped. I think we yeah when it comes to movies and things like that. I think. Um, they, they they gravitate a lot more to what can get in the big the big money sort of rolling and stuff. And I think what was really nice was to see when um, Joaquin Phoenix and Joker came out. Yeah, it showed that DC you can just do something dark. Yeah. It doesn't have yeah, to be yeah. a big budget. It doesn't have to sort of have like buildings blowing up and things like that. It can be just a really what what I think DC do best is dark. I you agree. Know? Yeah, I completely agree. We, Aquaman and all that sort of shit, trying to be what Marvel are doing. Do what you do best. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. the dark stuff, you know. Yeah, I mean, the Marvel stuff. I, I was a, I was always a very big fan of Daredevil growing up, and I think probably because I still have a fairly sizable collection in in South Africa, and I, I did, uh, I, I did an audit when I was there last year to make sure that my mom hadn't got rid of any of it, and everything was still on their backing boards with their plastic mm -hmm. covers and stuff. So one, one day I'll have all of it shipped over here, but. Um, Daredevil was was probably one of my favorites growing up, um, and uh, so so I never I, I was never really a huge fan of of a lot of the the more traditional superheroes. I like the Ultimate Spider Man um, mm. reboot that they did. I thought it was an interesting take on it. And Brian Michael Bendis, who wrote that, was one of my favorite comic book writers because he used to write a bunch of other really good stuff as well, like Powers. But um, yeah, I always gravitated to things like uh, the Darkness, uh, Hellspawn, Violent Messiahs, and, and and stuff like that. And I mean, those, they, I mean, all of those could be turned into fucking outstanding films, especially off the back of something like uh, the Joker. I, I'm going to assume that you like the Joker, by the way. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Did. I think it's a, a great example of what a, a superhero movie can be. You know, it doesn't have to be what um, what Marvel have made this cookie cutter sort of film franchise to be mm. you know you can be something else it can challenge people in different ways and i think it's 
I rem- I, I've seen Joker once, and I've seen uh, I've seen I don't know, uh, the the the, uh, the last Iron Man sort of once. I can remember more about the Joker. It stuck with me way more than any of those other movies did. Yeah, yeah. I, I gave I gave up on Marvel ages ago. I, I watched I watched uh, the Avengers with my daughter, and even I mean even she was bored, and I was like, this is the fucking biggest load of sh- nonsense I've ever seen in my mm-hmm. life. And I uh, I just said to her, oh, for some reason, Meadow, none of the other movies seem to want to work on Daddy's TV, so we can't watch those. <laughs> so, mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just but it's just. It wasn't- wasn't there um, rumors going around about them doing another Spawn reboot? Yeah, so uh, they 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 were working on it. I don't know what's happened with it. Uh, I know Todd McFarlane was going to be heavily involved in it. There was there was talk that it was going to be um, R-rated and and you know that they would would have would have, would do it justice. But I have no idea what the uh, what you know what what what's um, who's who, who is it? Somebody showed interest in playing Spawn as well. I actually, when they said about it, I was like, oh, it was Jay- Jamie Foxx, I think. Yeah, yeah, that was it. Yeah, yeah. And he'd signed up as long as he didn't have any lines, and I thought that'd be really cool. You know, yeah, but but Spawn ne- needs lines though. Did you ever watch the Spawn cartoon? No, I never got around to the cartoon. Uh, so like again, uh, uh, was- way way back before HBO became, uh, you know, Ga- Game of Thrones HBO. They actually had like a, a really, really good cartoon series of uh, of Spawn. I mean, and when I say good, I'm talking like R-rated, curse words, violence, you know, the works. It was way ahead of its time. But I don't know who they got to do the who they got to do the voice. But he reminded me a little bit of um, of Candyman. You remember that? You remember? Uh, Candyman? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, it was this really, really like dark, like uh, menacing kind of, kind of kind of voice, but in a very kind of dignity. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to use the phrase "black Republican" kind of <laughs> accent that he had, like like Uncle yeah. Phil from Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Yeah, 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 yeah. But you know what I mean, like a like a dark version of that. But it was but so cool. There was one bit where in 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 the in the show, there's this old man that continues this old homeless guy that kind of sees him for what he is and continually tries to guide him away from the darkness. And you know, Spawn is you know hell bent for revenge. He's going to you know kill any anything and everything that moves. That's that's fucked him off. And there's one bit where he looks at the old man and he. What's that? He says, I don't want to hear another word that you're about to utter. Now move, old man, or be moved. <laughs> <laughs> Absolute genius. But yeah, dude, you if you can ever, if you, I don't know where you'll find it. I think I saw some of it on, on YouTube. Mm. So if you can stand the shitty uh, the shitty quality, make sure you watch it. It's fucking brilliant. Cool. It, yeah. it, it, it's better, in my opinion, than 99% of comic book movies I've ever seen. Brilliant. Yeah, I mean, um, like, um, I do tend to sort of like, not watch anything for a while and then when you find something really cool you kind of like latch onto it and really get into yeah uh, so um that's why i've kind of like i don't know i'm I, it, it sat there waiting for me to watch it it's the uh the the watchman series as well you know yeah I've, I've heard good and bad things about this and i'm not really sure what i'm gonna i, I i'm not sure about that to be honest with you I, i'm by the way it's gonna okay so the guy that did spawn's voice is keith david and I know you'll you'll know exactly who he is if I if I show him to you. Mm-hmm. He was in um, I think he was in there something about Mary. Okay. I'm gonna hold my I'm gonna hold my phone up. This dude. Oh right, yeah, yeah. yeah but yeah. he's got yeah. this really like deep bass heavy voice, but fucking okay. perfect for it. Perfect. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it, it was him. This <laughs> there's something about Mary, and it's him that like opens up the door when uh, Ben Stiller comes to pick up Mary for the prom, and he's like, mm. uh, "What's him? Hi, oh, is Mary here?" Like, no, Mary's gone off with her boyfriend. Boogie's <laughs> 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 her boyfriend. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, well, I've I've heard very bad things about that um, about that Spawn show. I've I've not Spawn, sorry, uh, Watchmen. Mm. I've heard it's. I, uh, I didn't. I didn't mind the um, the Swamp Thing series actually. I thought that was actually not so bad. I, I, I think yeah, they that, nailed it. With, they nailed it with the makeup and everything. Just yeah, that, that, exactly that I've heard. That I've heard very good things about. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I thought, aside from from Joker, I thought Dread was uh, was the best thing based on Dread a comic book that I've ever seen. Actually, um, you know the movie Dread. There's the place called the Peach Tree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, the Peach Tree actually comes from Shrewsbury. Uh, really? Because the yeah, well, the guy who created Judd's Dread is from around the area. And the director and him, they had their like their kind of meeting about the movie in a restaurant called The Peach Tree in Shrewsbury. Holy so, fuck. Cool. cool. There you go. A little bit of 
Oh, the trivia for you. Dude, yeah. that, that movie, because I, I had been a huge fan of the Judge Dredd comics when I was young. Then the uh, Sylvester Stallone film came out and it literally put me off watching or even reading Dredd. It was so bad. Mm-hmm. And then, um, then the, the movie came out and I, with, with uh, Carl Urban and I was kind of, I, I, was, I, I was sort of nonplussed by it at first. And then I saw a trailer and I thought, you know, I was going to go to the cinema. I thought, you know what, Let, let's give this a go. I've never in my life, and I've been to thousands of films. I, I used to be a film critic for a period of time. I've never once seen an audience stand up and cheer for two minutes during the during the credits of a film. People mm. were fucking losing it. It was like it's like being at a at a live show. You know, anytime he he kills one of the bad guys, you just hear this eruption from the audience, like yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Um, he he nailed Dread. Oh my for god, me, he was incredible. Dread. There was rumors that he was having uh, talks about a series as well, a Dread series. Yeah, yeah. So they, so the the talks are that they were going to do a show called uh, Mega City One. Mm. Um, I don't know whether Carl Urban was ever uh, officially attached to it, but I know that he was talking to them about it, and apparently he was open to being in it. But I've never understood how in the fuck did they not turn that into a, into a, a TV show? It would just be it would just lend itself so well. I mean, there's exactly. just so much you could do with it. But they, they, well, they've got a fucking raft of comic, uh, mm. you know, of material that they can use as, as for, for, for reference. And if you kind of give it a, a serious, gritty edge, like, you know, not not maybe not as procedural as uh, The Wire, but you 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 kind of take a serious. You know, they they can't fuck it up. They can't make it lighthearted or family friendly or you know no, woke it's... or any of that bullshit. It, it needs to retain the 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 dread you know, the, the the dread attitude. It'll be it'll yeah, be one of, it'll be the best show ever. It would be fantastic. I mean, like you say, even just visually speaking as well and the whole world that they could build. I've been sort of like hoping for something quite cyberpunky to come out. And yeah. um, it, nothing really at the moment has, has hit it quite right. You know, they've all been a bit too CGI, a little bit too clean and stuff like that. And I think when the Dread movie came out, it had an atmosphere. It was believable. It was kind of like... Yeah this is the way it should actually, it's going to be, it's not going to be too different from what we have right now, but it's just going to be a lot more fucked up. Yeah. 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 Oh, I, I don't know whether you watched it recently, but I mean, that movie is more fucking relevant now than ever, especially mm-hmm. the opening, you know, when he's like citizens living in fear of the, of the, gang, yeah. of the gun, the gang. It's like, I think um, if, it, if, it, if it were up to me, dread would have been deployed fucking ages ago. Um, yeah. I would, I would be on the front lines with my bike. <laughs> um, but anyway, dude. So, how how badly has uh, has COVID nineteen hit your hit your store? And I mean, obviously, you guys have been in lockdown now since uh, the beginning of March. Yeah. Uh, well, we locked down when we were told to. Um, actually, it was my friend's birthday when we first heard about it, so we we locked down from that point. Um, we were hoping today, because uh, Boris Johnson did an announcement today, and um, we were hoping that we would be able to open beginning of July. Sadly, that's not going to be the case, um, which is totally fucked up because apparently hairdressers can open up, but we can't, even though we deal with, you know, cross-contamination, airborne pathogens, infection control, and, you know, all this sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, So out of any of these industries, we're the ones who are totally prepared for to be able to deal with something like this. And we can offer especially in my studio, we can offer the, the two meter rule, which is now one meter rule. We can, we can quite happily accommodate all that. Um, Plus you've got all the, uh, the markings and stuff to keep the witchcraft at bay. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. That'll work. That'll work. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, we're, we're just hoping that maybe there's kind of like a bit of a, an outcry from a artist and other studios to say, look, you know, you're, you know, I think it's just due to the people making this legislation and a little bit ill-informed about tattooing and, and yeah. how clean it actually is. Uh, we have to go through a lot of hoops uh, just to get licensing. So we're very experienced in all this. So we're hoping that maybe they reconsider the beginning of July or at least the middle of July. That would be kind of okay. It's just very difficult to work when you don't have an end date. That's the problem. Of course, yeah. yeah, yeah. If we didn't give, if they said, okay, you're not allowed to open until August. Okay, fine. We know that. At least mm-hmm. we can now prepare and we can prepare our clients and stuff for it. But without ha- being given anything, that's that's the struggle, I think. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And so how, um, uh, you know, what have you been keeping yourself busy with in the uh, in the off time? 
Um, what I've been doing is, I, the first thing I did, I managed to get a load of jobs done around the studio. I repainted a lot of the place and oiled the floors, and you know, real. I was about to say, mate, it looks. You know, I can only tell from the from the the camera uh, that you're that you're kind of talking through, but it looks very, uh, yeah, it looks looks very swank. It's like it's it's you know, um, satanic it's chic. Really, uh, satanic <laughs> chic, I like that one. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, yeah, we managed to sort of like reorganize a lot of the studio and kind of get all these jobs that you know you've. Uh, I'll get around to that at some point. Yeah, it was kind of like, it, well, I've got however long to do it, so I'm going to get around and I can do all those. So I did all that, and then took a little bit of time to kind of come down a little bit, and now I'm starting to get ready to kind of prepare for clients and do some more artwork and drawings and things like that, and get some digital paintings on the way, that sort of thing. Um, so it's nice to get like finally get some artwork that I've had up on the walls and get those kind of seen how I really wanted them to, to be seen. Um, and also we've been communicating with like a lot of other local businesses and things like that. And um, hopefully we're going to be working with some little collaborations with those as well, kind of help each other throughout this whole thing. No, so, cool. It's, it's, it's in learning how to manage a downtime, I think, which I do quite well. Um, yeah. I can predict normally, when we're going to go quiet sort of like around your christmas time sometimes the height of summer when it's ridiculously hard a lot of people don't want to get tattooed so it's like okay so how am i going to manage this time well so i think that's quite a, an important thing to be able to do yeah yeah mm. well brother i'm gonna let you go i really appreciate the time i had a fucking blast talking to you and you. uh you know we will have to do it again at some point and the other thing that i'm going to yeah. do is uh if my uh I'll, I'll, when i drive back up to come and uh, see go see my daughter again and she's she doesn't come yeah uh, might have, might might have to uh, swing past uh, Shrewsbury and come and say hello. Anytime, man. Yeah, come in. We'll hang out and we'll share the space and share some dead things. <laughs> <laughs> Badass. I will yeah. do. All right, dude. Take care. Take man. care of yourself. You. Bye bye. Did have one DMT trip way back, like maybe the second or third or fourth way back, where it was completely different. It's the only one I've ever had like that, and it was completely different, and the way I put it to myself was the big people were home, and uh, it was an entirely different feeling, and many people, actually, I've never quite had this myself, but many people report the MT trips where they break in on an entity who is not pleased at all and demands to know how the hell you got there.
thank you very much to Mark Weatherhead of One for Sorrow Tattoo for joining the show. Um, when Mark and I recorded that interview, uh, we were in the throes of, uh, of some fairly tight lockdown regulations here in the UK. Those have now lifted, actually. So uh, I'm recording this on the 13th of July. And uh, I believe today is the day that uh, Tattoo Studios actually managed to reopen. So as you can see, if you're uh, watching this on YouTube, we're uh, we're experiencing not only the uh, the first day in the in our allocated three weeks of sunshine here in the UK, but uh, Mark Studio will be back open again. So if you're in the UK and you want to get a piece of work done, um, you all would be well advised uh, to look him up. Um, great guy, and and as I said, just a, just a really fun conversation. Um, obviously, because Mark is not in a band, I uh, moved toward, uh, or I had to look to other sources for music, um, and so I turned to the official house band of Into the Necrosphere, the mighty Stellar Master Elite, uh, and the track that you heard uh, as uh, we closed off the interview was Ad Infinitum uh, off of uh, Stellar Master Elite's absolutely fucking spectacular Hologram Temple record. Um, and uh, I uh, did receive the very enjoy or the, the very encouraging news the other night um, that apparently the guys have got some studio time booked for January. So um, we may possibly see a, a new Stellar Master Elite album emerge at some point next year. Hologram Temple, of course. If you uh, if you checked out my top twenty of twenty nineteen, was my favorite album of, uh, uh, of of the year, and it beat out such illustrious competition as uh, Demon by Mayhem, which is seriously saying something. So, if you've not yet checked out Hologram Temple, I suggest that you uh, that you make a move to do so very quickly. But speaking of albums that are worth checking out, uh, Old Smoke by Barishi. So, um, like I said at the top of the show. Um, Katie Irizarry first uh, uh, reminded me of this record and um, I am going to apologize to the band right now if they are watching this for mistaking them for the uh, interminably shit band that opened for Metallica on their European tour last year, Bokasa. Uh They could not sound any further from them if they tried. Um, Barishi have been around um, since 2012. They put out their first record in 2013 uh, called simply Barishi. Uh, 2016, uh, they released Blood from the Lion's Mouth, and uh, this now is their third record four years later, Old Smoke. Um, it is the first for the band as a, uh, as a three-piece. Uh, Sasha Sims, who was a vocalist on uh, on the last two records, uh, have left and uh, has been replaced by Graham Brooks, who also plays guitar. And uh, Graham mentioned something quite interesting in an interview that I read a couple of weeks ago where he was talking about the Sasha Sims loyalists. Um, I don't know whether this is a uh, broadly acknowledged group in, uh, in metal circles, but I, I will say that if indeed they do exist – they are going to find uh, very little to complain about on Old Smoke. I think that as far as Barishi is concerned and having now gone back into their back catalogue, I think Old Smoke is probably the most well-realized version of the band that we've heard to date. Um, broadly speaking, it's heavier, it's more intense, it's aggressive, uh, it's, more progr it's more progressive. Um, and you know, as much as the band wear their um, their influences very very openly on their sleeves, you know, so you'll hear the likes of Mastodon, Enslaved, um, you know, lots of death metal. Uh, it, I think they are are really coming into their own as a um, an, ex, an ex, a band who's not afraid to experiment, um, but a band who really knows their way around a fucking nasty, mean ass riff. Uh, so this is a track off of Old Smoke. Uh, the song is called uh, The Long Hunter. He told the hunter that he had been a minister and had come over the mountains with the Donner Party. He passed that horrible winter with them and saw men commit hideous acts. He said that he himself had eaten human flesh, but it survived because he had faith, faith in a new master.
That was The Long Hunter by Barishi off of Old Smoke. It has been available since April the 24th on um, Season of Mist, and uh, I may very well reach out to uh, to Katie at some point and see whether or I can get those guys on the show. Um, like I said, absolutely superb record, and uh, if, you're, uh, if, sh- if you're short on things to listen to at the moment and uh, you want to hear something new, uh, I would uh, I would highly recommend it. Um, okay, let's uh, let's do some news now. By the way, if you guys are uh, are watching the video on on YouTube, you'll see that behind me there's a uh, there's a couple of boxes. Uh, one is a uh, uh, for a Niagara twelve hundred by a company called AudioQuest. Another is for a, a an amplifier by a company called Emotiva. Um, I've kind of been uh, throwing the idea around of starting a uh, a channel focused on hi-fi but specifically with uh, with metal folk in mind because i think you know having been a uh a, a, well, having been almost obsessive about the hobby now for the last couple of years um i will say that it it's not really something that necessarily caters to people that listen to our kind of music um and what i see a lot on social media are people that are clearly very passionate about music potentially have the money to spend on a decent system but just don't necessarily know enough about how it works um to know where to start or to know what to look for or to know what represents a bargain and what doesn't um you know i myself was in that exact same situation about three four years ago until i until i really sort of got into it so what i was thinking is having a channel where i can kind of share some of those uh, or some of the things that i learned um and i continue to learn um, but also talking about specific components, you know, things that you can pick up on. I mean, I might go as low as things that you can pick up on eBay for for cheap, you know, all the way through to uh, to higher end components. And then, uh, and then, like I said, reviewing them um, and talking to you guys about them with a view on uh, on what they would sound like, um, you know, if you're banging "Hate Them" by Dark Throne or something that's not necessarily recorded with a uh, three million dollar budget. Um, so uh, let me know if that's an idea that uh, you guys would be interested in. Um, and, uh, you know, if it's not, it's not the end of the world. But um, I, uh, I, I I, kind of feel like, I mean, I'm just personally so interested in it. And I, and I love having conversations with people about um, about Hi-Fi. Uh, I think it could be fun. So, uh, you know, if, if nothing else, I may end up doing it on um, on the show. Um, so we could uh, we could incorporate the two, but I think it it might lend itself better to, to kind of like a five to ten minute format. Um, but anyway, like I said, I, I thought I would share that because it's just an idea that I've been uh, tossing around. Let's talk about uh, the news. So uh, the first uh, site we will check in with is uh, as usual um, Metal Storm, uh, and let's go down. So. A Gatho Demon sign worldwide deal with Napalm Records. It actually wasn't too long ago that I was talking to a friend of mine about a Gatho Demon and uh, how I wish they would uh, they would do something again. Uh, they were uh, they were a band that was I mean that goes way back to the old school. I remember hearing a track by them uh, on the same Nuclear Blast soundtrack compilation uh, that Demon Borg had put out. Um, I think it was in the Morning Palace. Uh, or Succubus in Rapture. It was one of the tracks off of um, off of Enthroned Darkness Triumphant. Um, and Agatha Demon was on there as well. And I actually almost preferred the Agatha Demon track, um, you know, as much as my, I think, 15-year-old self was completely blown away by uh, by Demon Borger. But I'm glad to see that uh, that these guys are back. Um, it's been seven years since their last record. So, uh, you know, I'm sure they've, uh, they're coming back uh, older, wiser, and hopefully meaner. Um, but, uh, yeah, like I said, I thought, I thought it was funny timing, uh, since I'd been talking about it, I would bet given that I've been talking about it, quite a few, uh, other folks must've been talking about it also. Cataclysm upcoming album detailed first track launched. I've said this before cataclysm in my mind are one of those bands that they, they could write the heaviest record that they could possibly muster and there would be ACDC tracks in my mind that would sound a lot more menacing and a lot more scary. They remind me a bit of, of Belfagor in that sense. There's just certain bands I, I, and I don't know what it is because I've, I've, I don't know whether the guys in the band are too nice. Um, I, I don't know what the deal is, but I, I, as much as I can't put my finger on it, I have yet to hear a Cataclysm album beyond uh, their third record, Temple of Knowledge, that has done anything for me whatsoever. Enslaved reveal video for second single Jetta Krita, or what the hell ever that uh, that word is. 
Um, I'm starting to get more excited now about this new album, Utgard. Uh, I've been such a huge fan of Enslaved for so many years. And, you know, I, I do find with a lot of their records, it does take you at least, you know, five to 10 listens to thoroughly get into it. And, and it's one of those things where you kind of need to get over that hump to uh, to completely start appreciating it. But, uh, you know, any year that Enslaved is releasing a new record, in my opinion, uh, is a good one. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, and, and I can say with a fair degree of confidence, I, I bet you, Udgard is going to be uh, riding pretty high at the top of many year end lists. Part of the reason why I'm doing that that half year check in is is actually because I feel like there's there's a bit of a recency bias um, when people do their year end favorites because they kind of by the time that you know it's November December and they start doing those lists, I think a lot of journalists have uh, oh and podcasters have, have listened to certain records so many times that that what is new and fresh. Uh, tends to be uh, you know that bit more more interesting and therefore maybe you know goes up a little bit higher on the lists um, and that's part of why I think uh, doing these half time uh, or you know half year lists I think are, are, are pretty interesting and it also helps if uh, you know in case anybody has for you know missed anything out um, they can check it out and uh, like I said that's why uh, Rick Eaglestone and I. Are going to be doing one uh, very soon. Rick Eaglestone, um, just so you guys know, though, he runs his own podcast. Um, super cool guy. Um, his name sounds like he should be one of the one of the newsmen on Anchorman that have those fights in uh, in the alleyway. <laughs> anyway, uh, Black Crown Initiate, a new song and video released. Uh, this is another one of those bands that people really love, and um, I don't know, just always fail to do anything for me. Um, I remember on the uh, the Metal Sucks podcast when it was uh, hosted by Chuck and Godless, how people used to fucking, or those two, used to freak out about this band. Um, and I tried listening to the record that had come out at the time that they were doing that podcast and that they were raving about, and it just did nothing for me. Um, I have uh, I've no idea why, but uh, I, I just can't get into them. Ascension of the Watchers, new label album coming in October. Ascension of the Watchers, of course, is the uh, kind of like gothic rock side project um, with uh, Burton Bell from uh, from Fear Factory, and uh, they've actually done some very cool stuff. Um, they they did a cover of the Sound of Silence, which you know I know that song has been covered to death. You know, you had Nevermore doing it, you had Disturbed doing it. Um, but they actually did, in my view, probably the best cover of the track. Um, and uh, yeah, they they uh, they've over the years they they've released some some pretty interesting music. So I will be looking forward to that. Uh, Selbst share two tracks from new record. Now, if ever there is a an album that I am seriously fucking looking forward to, it's this. Um, I have spoken about this band many times. They were on my uh, top 50 favorite black metal bands list. Uh, I have already spoken to uh, to one of the guys in the band uh, about coming onto the show. And if you checked out the episode that I did with um, with Simon from uh, Aversio Humanitatis, obviously he did the, uh, the reamping and some of the production and the, the recording for this record. So everything I've heard so far about this album is masterful, and I cannot wait to hear the rest. And by the way, if you have not heard the first Selbst record, um, do yourself a favor and, uh, and get hold of it. It is it's staggeringly good. So we move on. I know one of the, uh, I was just about to say, I know one of the bits of news that's going to pop up, and that is that uh, Napalm Death are uh, releasing a, their new record finally. Uh, I mean, you know, I've, I've spoken before about wanting to get Barney on the show and... Um, my idea to do the uh, I Side With um, quiz with him. And I Side With, for those of you guys that don't know, is uh, basically a uh, quiz that you can do online about politics. And it, it's very cool, actually, because it it asks you questions about your views on specific policies and specific, um, specific uh, programs that the government uh, may or may not run. Um, and if you don't know what they're talking about, then it's got like a big explanation to say, okay, this is what this means, blah, blah, blah. This is why certain people support it and why certain people don't. And then right at the end, it gives you a, uh, a percentage rating about which political leader you align to most. 
Um, and uh, unless I've cut it out of my interview with um, with Mark, you, I, I, I probably would have spoken about it in the interview that you've uh, that you've seen earlier. But anyway, um, I would love to get him on. But I, I have to say, as much as I, as much I, I kind of played through in my mind, and uh, I think there's going to be a lot that we that we have in common. I mean, I've met him before, and you know, he's a he's a great guy. But I, I think there may be a few things that we uh, we don't see eye to eye on, and, and you know what I what I wouldn't want to do is um, is co- you know cause a scene or cause a fuss with a guy whose music I generally really really enjoy, um, and then you kind of have that that I guess that negative connotation to uh, to the music forever after, and you know Napalm Death from my perspective is. You know that in that uh, death grind list that I I was talking about, that's a top three name in my opinion. Um, and uh, you know, 2015's Apex Predator, Easy Meat was magnificent. I mean, they haven't made a shit album since Fear, or not not since, but you know, pretty much ever. I, you know, I think Utopia Vanished, by comparison, wasn't as good. But basically, from Fear, Emptiness, Despair on, it has been nothing short of one classic after the other. Uh, so this is coming out on Century Media on September the 18th. Um, and again, I'll look forward to that. Uh, I'm not such a big fan of the uh, of the album cover, but uh, I get where they're coming from with it. And then uh, here's the statement by, uh, by Barney. So vocalist Mark Barney Greenway checked in with the following comment about the upcoming album and its theme. The phrase sticking in my mind when I started thinking about the lyrical direction for this album was The Other. You could recognize at the time that there was a rapidly growing fear and paranoia being generated about everybody, from migrating people to people with fluid sexuality, and this was starting to manifest itself in very antagonistic reactions that you felt were almost verging on violence. Not everybody resorts to such reactions, of course, but even the basic lack of understanding can become toxic over time. I'm not saying that this is an entirely new phenomenon, but it has been stoked in recent history by some particularly attack-minded people in more political circles, and as ever, I felt that it would be the natural antidote to endorse basic humanity and solidarity with all. Uh, which is, you know, for the most part, I think a, a very um, some very valid points to make, and uh, you know, I, I think uh, if anything. It should uh, should make for interesting lyrics, but either way, uh, "Throws of Joy in the Jaws of Defeatism" is a record that is very, very, very high up on my list of um, of albums that I'm looking forward to this year. Alongside that, Salps album and an El Nathrak. Let's see if there's anything else here worth looking at. Uh, I suspect no. Gaera, third track from upcoming record, Unleashed. Uh, that's coming out in two weeks' time. Gaera is a uh, black metal band out of Portugal, I believe. Uh, everything that they have released so far off this new album, um, Conspiranoia, um, sounded top notch. So, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward. Actually, sorry, the album's not called Conspiranoia. I'm wrong. It's called Limbo. Um, that's going to be another season of missed release. So, uh, you know, probably another one in the, uh, in a long list of fucking home runs for that label. Uh, I think that's pretty much what I wanted to cover on uh, on Metal Storm. So let's move on to uh, my favorite part of uh, every episode, Blabbermouth. Uh, I wanted to – I read this this morning. So Great White, just so you guys know. I mean, firstly, I think the vast majority of people that used to listen to them are of the generation who are either filing for pension or are now in a risk category to uh, – for uh, for picking up coronavirus, i.e., they're older than seventy years old, um, which is why it makes it so uh, interesting that uh, that Great White decided to do a show where they had no face masks, no social distancing of any kind, and just kind of kept things kept things going as normal. What I also don't understand, however, is why so much space gets dedicated to them on so many me- so many record labels, uh, not record labels, sorry, um, uh, music websites. Uh, they just, I mean, they've never been, in my view, particularly good. And I, I'm also not sure that they are particularly relevant. So on one page, three fucking posts about Great White. Boo to Great White. Um, at least what they, uh, what, uh, well, at least there's been no Corey Taylor uh, posts yet. Um, I'm sure that is, uh, th- th- that'll come very soon. This one uh, caught my eye. Renowned epidemiologist 
and geopolitical expert Rob Flynn, also f- founder of Machine Head on coronavirus pandemic. I think this thing's going to go on for two to probably four years. Based upon what exactly, Rob fucking buffoon Flynn? The good thing for him is if uh, if it does go on for uh, two to probably four years, he can continue to write his uh, or to innovate his new style of woke metal and uh, keep releasing one after the other song that uh, completely tarnishes the legacy of his once great band. Repentance featuring Stuck Mojo X Soil members, X Soil member in Sean Glass. They don't mention that Sean Glass used to be a member of Broken Hope. Uh, after whose track Into the Necrosphere this podcast is named. I've not heard that uh, that band yet, but I will check it out. Hopefully it's nothing like um, the monstrosity that was Chris Adler's uh, turn in Firstborn. Lamb of Gods, uh, Mark Morton says, Trump is grossly underestimating his base's intelligence. Again, based on what? Official Alice Cooper chocolate milk coming this fall. God bless Alice. That dude is what, 72, 73 years old? I might be wrong, but I, I mean, I know he's a, he's, you know, he's a, a senior by any stretch of the imagination. He's definitely getting discount when he dry, when he takes the bus. Um, and uh, he still seems to, in spite of the fact that he's, you know, very open about being a Christian and, and uh, you know, very, uh, you know, very outspoken about a number of things that would possibly put him at odds with a lot of folk in the metal community. He's one guy that you very rarely hear a bad word said about, which I think is very interesting. New crab species named after Nightwish. Uh, when I first saw that, I, I thought to myself that uh, some <laughs> some uh, folk or 4chan that came up with that, but uh, not so much. I think that is just about it, guys. I don't think there's anything worth uh, worth really taking the piss out of or really talking uh, about in any great detail. Um, what I will do is to say thank you very much once again for tuning in. Uh, a reminder that next week is uh, my interview with Dan Thornton from Crimson Throne. Uh, it was a good one, as uh, as all my fucking episodes are. Um, but I'm sure you guys are going to enjoy that very much. And, um, you know, Crimson Throne, uh, you know, as as has been the case with some of my recent guests, you know, were really right up at the top of uh, of bands or band members, at least, um, or m- members of, I should say, that I wanted to get on the show. So it was a lot of fun talking to uh, talking to Dan. Um, it turns out we have a lot more in common than just uh, than just liking the metal. So uh, you know the conversation went into to all sorts of directions. I think we spent about fifteen minutes talking about weightlifting. So, uh, and speaking of weightlifting, uh, the gyms open back up in two weeks' time in the UK, and uh, the sooner I can get my fucking fat ass into uh, into a place with some decent uh, decent weights, the better. Um, And on that inspiring note, um, I am going to bid you all a fond farewell. Have a fucking great week, everybody, and uh, I will see you all next week. (laughs)